Welcome to Recurring Insight. It's the beginning of your upkeep, so it's time for another episode. I'm your host, Michael, and let's dive in. Today, we'll be looking at three polymorph decks. The one we'll be looking at are Urza Polykraken, made by Eisenhertz, Keegan52, Sinivy, and Urza Server, Malcolm and Kedis Polyhorn by Jackalope King, and Teamer Polykraken by Ifan and the Tangelo. The links for all of these decks is in the description. A brief introduction before we get too far. Polymorph effects allow you to remove a creature to get a creature out of your library onto the battlefield. If the deck only has one creature, then you'll only hit that creature, and you can turn polymorph effects into one card win conditions. There is plenty of redundancy for the effect, which grants polymorph decks amazing consistency. However, they also must limit the number of creatures they run, which cuts off access to a lot of powerful cards. Let's get into the combos they run. The combo creature in both Urza as well as Thras and Roger is Hullbreaker Horror. If you've got two permanents that are mana positive together, you can bounce them back and forth. With Hullbreaker Horror on the field, cast a spell, tap the permanent for mana, and use the trigger to return it to hand. The spell resolves, then you can cast the first permanent and repeat ad infinitum. Hullbreaker Horror is a strictly bettered Tidespout Tyrant, as it allows you to interact on the stack. Additionally, although the plan certainly isn't to actually cast it, if you draw into it, Hullbreaker Horror costs less and is uncounterable. Tyrant can hit lands, and there are situations where that's relevant, such as bouncing your own Mystic Sanctuary to hand. However, this isn't enough to redeem him, and he is firmly second to Hullbreaker. Mono Blue only has a few copies of the Polymorph effect, but getting access to Red gives quite a few more copies, one of which can be cast multiple times. As a result, Tyrant is cut from Urza, but still makes it into Thras and Roger. Redundancy would be the only other argument for Tyrant's inclusion, but considering Urza is an outlet for colorless mana allows it to run a variety of other combos that the deck can pivot to. Urza and Thras and Roger are uniquely positioned to take advantage of Hullbreaker Horror. Urza produces a construct for Polymorph, while Rograk is zero mana. This makes Roger an excellent target for Polymorph, and it can serve as one of the two permanents you're bouncing. Although Urza is four mana, being able to tap any Chario for mana makes it much easier to combo off, especially considering the mana produced is blue. Finally, they both serve as outlets for the infinite mana which also affects the other combos they run. Malcolm and Kedis aren't outlets for the combo, so instead, it runs Glinthorn Buccaneer. Malcolm doesn't require the damage dealt to be combat damage, so if you've got both on the field, move to combat, swing with Buccaneer, and activate him. In a pot of three, you'll get three Malcolm triggers, netting you one treasure each iteration. From there, you can ping your opponents to death. Malcolm and Kedis eschew the Dramatic Scepter combo for the same reason they don't include Hullbreaker Horror. It does make it into the other two decks though, since it produces infinite mana as long as you have at least 3 mana from non-land permanents. Breach allows you to repeatedly recast Lotus Petal for mana, which allows you to repeatedly cast Brain Freeze, milling the cards you need to exile in order to repeatedly recast both of them. This is included in both red decks. If you would like more information about the combo, you can check out the dedicated guide in the top right. Finally, Urza runs Power Artifact, which combos with Grim Monolith to make infinite mana, since untapping Monolith costs less than it produces when enchanted. With Urza, you can filter that into Colorless as well. That applies to the Dramatic Scepter line too. Now that we've covered how the decks win, let's look at how the decks play, starting with the removal. They all run Chain of Vapor and Cyclonic Rift. Chain of Vapor is an excellent card that can either be used as removal with political options or as a ritual with mana positive rocks. It's not as useful as a ritual in Urza, since every artifact you have is a mana rock with Urza. Urza also invests more heavily into the field, so your opponents copying it will hit harder. The decks can't run Dockside, so they have no reason to exclude Cyclonic Rift since it doubles as a one-sided board wipe. The red decks get some options that Urza doesn't. The two lands are not the best removal, but the only cost to include these is life. They don't have black, so the drawback is minimal. Both decks run Pyroblast, which normally plays second fiddle to REB. 
However, Pyroblast can trigger Hullbreaker Horror without there being another blue permanent on the field, so that is a point in its favor. Urza can tap artifacts for mana, so Spellbomb makes the cut. It's extremely versatile as well. Resculpt also makes it in for its versatility, as the other comparable cards are bounce spells or can't hit creatures and artifacts. Speaking of bounce spells, Malcolm and Kedis run three that don't make it into the others. Blink of an Eye and Into the Royal allow Malcolm and Kedis to spend the mana they generate to draw a card as well, while Unsubstantiate hits spells as well. They also run Flame Sweep, which is essentially one-sided. Worst case scenario, you hit Kedis. It and the other effects could also make it into Thras and Roger, and there's a list on the database that does invest heavier into board wipes. This iteration of the team or partners is more proactive though, and cuts them as a result. Red Elemental Blast makes it into Malcolm and Kedis as well. In the absence of green, Malcolm and Kedis resort to artifact specific removal, but with the stress on versatility. A braid can hit creatures as well, while you find some prisoners doubles as card draw, and allows some spicy plays with top of deck tutors. Thras and Roger do have access to green, and thus run Nature's Claim. The amount of removal is relatively low, which is typical for more proactive decks. If you're interested, the removal suite guide is linked in the top right. Let's shift our focus from the field to the stack. All three decks run these free counter spells, as well as these normal counter spells. They're staples for a reason, and none of the decks have reason to exclude them. They also all run Muddle the Mixture, which is stack interaction and a tutor rolled into one. Urza and Thras and Roger can use it to find either half of the Dramatic Scepter combo, while the red decks can use it to find Breach. That's especially important considering how few tutors in their colors can find Breach. Urza can also use it to find either half of the Power Artifact combo, and is the only tutor in Urza that can actually tutor for it. Now that we've got those out of the way, let's look at where they differ. The red decks get access to Deflecting Swat, Pyroblast, and REB. Deflecting Swat and Pyroblast are both included for the majority of decks that can run them, but Red Elemental Blast only makes it into Malcolm and Caddis. Thras and Roger get access to Veil of Summer, which is run in every single green deck. Interestingly though, both them and Ursa also run Narset's Reversal. Since you're functionally taking someone's spell, it has the potential to be very spicy, especially considering the popularity of Adnaz. But for the most part, it protects your own instants and sorceries. It's a curiously proactive spell which, with its ability to serve as protection, earns it an inclusion. It also enables Twister loops, since both it and Twister will hit the yard before the copy of Twister resolves. Additionally, it has use in the Dramatic Scepter combo. You can exile it under the Copy Artifact version of Scepter and infinitely cast any instant or sorcery. The Sands Green decks don't have access to Veil of Summer, but they do run Delay. It's a good, 2 mana, universal counter that only requires 1 blue mana. It's cut from Thras and Roger because decks only have so many slots for interaction, and it has other options. Urza is the only deck that runs Counterspell as a result of being the only mono blue deck. The lack of access to other colors is also why it runs Mindbreak Trap, but the popularity of the combos and archetypes that this hits has grown recently as well. Ultimately, it is a meta choice though. Finally, Malcolm and Kedis run Unsubstantiate. The deck can generate insane amounts of mana, and takes advantage of it by running some more versatile spells, one of which is Unsubstantiate. I do also have a sweet guide for stack interaction, which is linked in the top right. Now that we've looked at how the decks protect themselves and prevent others from winning, let's dig into what fuels the decks and keeps them running. They all run the best cantrips. They're great turn 1 plays in decks without green, and can help fix opening hands. If you've noticed that Preordain is missing, good for you, we'll get to that in a second. The best engines blue has to offer are also included. They also run the two best blue wheels. They all primarily use artifacts for ramp, so they can dump their hands relatively easily and refill them. The two sands green decks both run Cephalid Coliseum, since Thras and Roger need to accommodate more colors. 
Dig Through Time serves as a dump for the large amounts of mana that Urza and Malcolm and Caddis can generate. Preordain is cut from Thras and Roger, most likely for space reasons. Moving on to the decks with red, they get access to Faithless Looting and Jessica's Will. Looting provides excellent card selection, and Jessica's Will is very good in decks that can consistently cast their commanders early, which is also something Polymorph decks want. They also run both wheels. They play Breach and are proactive decks, so these fit right in. Urza's insane synergy with artifacts is what allows Arkham's Astrolabe to make it in. It's a cantrip that Urza can tap for mana, and it can draw the deck with Hullbreaker out. Eye of Vecna is more expensive, but in addition to cantripping, it also serves as a draw engine. It's not so great outside of Urza, but it's fantastic in it. Mishra's Bauble is either a Mox Sapphire with Urza or a free cantrip. Sensei's Divining Top is a good artifact outside of Urza, and Urza just makes it better. The ability to have a piece that either taps for mana or cycles, depending on what's needed, is extremely useful and helps a lot with consistency. Urza works well with cantrips in general, since you can cast him and tap the construct right away to cantrip. Although Recurring Insight doesn't have anything to do with artifacts, the sheer amount of mana that Urza is capable of producing is the reason it sees play here. Also, cheers for Recurring Insight, not that I'm biased. War Room passes a couple hurdles to make it into Urza. Urza's concentration of artifacts makes it better equipped to deal with colorless mana than most decks, as well as it generating large amounts of reusable mana. Especially considering it's a mono color deck, War Room fits right in. These two curiosity effects make it into Malcolm and Caddis because they trigger whenever the damage is dealt by the creature, so each trigger from an enchanted Malcolm with Caddis on the field will draw you three cards. It also runs Fiery Islet, which can help prevent mana flooding. I am surprised Fiery Islet didn't make it into Thras and Roger, but they do need a land base that can accommodate more colors than the other decks, so utility land slots are tight. Pull From Tomorrow is an excellent mana dump for the mana Malcolm and Caddis can generate. The same goes for Seagate Restoration. I would have expected Urza to run this one since it is also capable of going crazy mana-wise, but the deck does run back to basics. It also heavily relies on Mystic Sanctuary for recursion, as you'll see in a bit, so it places an emphasis on islands. Thras and Roger also cut Seagate Restoration, since they're least likely to be able to cast it. One card I haven't seen in a while makes it in as well. Smuggler's Copter takes advantage of Caddis, who is typically just there to get multiple Malcolm triggers. Finally, they also play You Find Some Prisoners, which is removal that doubles as card draw. The only card unique to Thras and Roger is Sylvan Library. It's a staple, and if the other decks had access to it, they'd play it too. Let's take a look at the tutors each deck runs. First up are the Polymorph effects. Each deck runs Polymorph and Proteus Staff, but they're the only ones that Urza runs. There are other mono blue options, but they clock in at 6 mana. These are the best two it can run. The red decks get some more redundancy with Reality Scramble and Transmogrify. Interestingly, only Thras and Roger run Divergent Transformations. It does require that at least two creatures be on the field, but it still typically costs 4 mana. You either need to be willing to hit your own creatures, or give your opponents the same effect. Thras and Roger are both cheap, so they're good fodder, but Malcolm and Kedis require Malcolm to stay on the field for Buccaneer, so the only option is to target an opponent's creature. This does present the opportunity for some spice, as you can use it to get rid of a stacks piece while finding your win con, but it could go the other way, with them flipping into a piece that stops the combo. Additionally, Malcolm and Kedis don't run Hullbreaker Horror, so it can't just bounce the creature like Thras and Roger can. Thras and Roger also run both Tyrant and Horror, so it can fetch them both for an extra resilient combo. Finally, Thras and Roger run Oath of Druids, since they're the only deck that can. Besides those, there are only 4 tutors all 3 decks have in common. It's easy enough to use Intuition to get a Polymorph effect, so there's always a good pile. Mystical Tutor is a staple. Solve the Equation is worse, but still good. Tutoring any instant or sorcery to hand without conditions is not something that Blue had at a reasonable rate before this. 
All of the decks rely on artifacts for ramp and run Proteus staff, so Transmute Artifact will consistently have Sack Fodder and a good target. Finally, we have Urza's Saga. Although it can't be relied on to assemble a combo, it will find the mana rocks that Hullbreaker Horror combos with. Besides the extra Polymorph effects, Red also gets access to Gamble, and both Red decks run it. It's a staple for a reason. The Sands Green decks both run Whir of Invention. The Triple Blue is more of a concern for the Teamer deck, but it also can't use the Improvise Clause, like Urza and Malcolm and Kedis can. It also allows Urza to deal with a Rule of Law effect. You can find Proteus Staff on an opponent's end step, activate the Staff, and use the first Hullbreaker trigger to bounce that effect. Malcolm and Kedis do cut Fabricate, since it primarily relies on the Sorcery Polymorph effects versus Proteus Staff. And unlike the other decks, it doesn't run Scepter. Thras and Roger also run Crop Rotation, which makes sense considering the number of utility lands being run. Some important mentions for this deck are Urza Saga, Barbarian Ring, Treasure Vault, Emergence Zone, and Ancient Tomb. Urza's monocolor status once again makes an impact, causing him to run tutors that the higher colored decks don't. Inventor's Fair is one, but it mostly makes it in since Urza is so focused on artifacts. I could also see this being run in Malcolm and Caddis, since they can consistently trigger it. On the other hand, Merchant Scroll and Personal Tutor rarely make it out of Mono Blue, and the Polymorph plan allows Izzet decks to run more tutors than it normally has access to. The same goes for Tezzy. If you'd like more information, the Sweet Guide for Tutors is linked in the top right. Let's take a look at the stacks pieces that see play. First up are the stacks pieces that Thras and Roger run, which is none. They're more proactive and have a decent amount of colors, so they don't have any real incentive to play them. Urza, as well as Malcolm and Kedis, both run Narset Parter of Veils. In addition to hitting card draw, she's also card draw. Malcolm and Kedis can better abuse her with the extra red wheels they have, but Urza is more able to protect her, so it's a horse apiece. Besides Narset, Malcolm and Kedis run Chalice of the Void. It's an excellent hate piece, and is typically played where X is 2, to hit interaction and the many combos that rely on a 2 CMC card. Urza gets hit too hard by Chalice to run it, even with the artifact synergies. It has quite a few pieces to make up for it though. Back to Basics is a powerful piece that can turn off higher color decks. Pything Needle, Tormod's Crypt, and Torpor Orb aren't exceptional, but the fact that they're artifacts with a relevant, albeit niche ability, earns them a spot. The Tabernacle at Pendril Veil is a potent piece against creature-heavy decks, which this one certainly isn't. The deck can't run Curse Totem without shutting off Urza, but this does the trick. The variety of the artifacts is important. Urza runs a very high density of artifact tutors, so it can search for the silver bullet it needs pretty consistently without having to dilute the deck with worse versions of these cards. Finally, it runs these three brutal stacks pieces. Urza can tap them at any time, so he can break parity on them without breaking a sweat. Each of these pieces is potent enough to allow Urza to seize control of the game. I do have a stack sweet guide available, but I've run out of links since apparently YouTube puts a limit on that. If you're interested, part 1 and part 2 are up on the channel. When things don't go to plan, some recursion is always helpful. Underworld Breach is a combo piece in the red decks, but it can serve as recursion as well. It's the only recursion that Malcolm and Caddis run. Mystic Sanctuary is fetchable, and Three Islands is an easy requirement to meet in a mono blue deck, considering you're most likely going to need to recur something later in the game. The other decks run quite a few non-basics for utility and color fixing, so it's understandable that only Urza runs it. Thras and Roger get access to some green recursion, the best of which is Noxious Revival. I've said it before and I'll say it again, Phyrexian mana was a mistake. Memory's Journey is a little more interesting. It can stop Thoracle Winds, but it's primarily included to support Oath of Druids. If a necessary piece gets milled, it can be shuffled in before the draw step. It also enables Twister Loops. It's time to move on to the ramp and see how the decks plan to support their game plan. Since they all primarily use artifacts, they have a lot in common. These are the free rocks that make it into each deck. 
The least commonly seen rock is Mox Opal. However, they all rely heavily on artifacts, and it's a rock that combos with Hullbreaker Horror. Then they've got the other artifact staples. They also run some Land Ramp. Only the red decks run Arcane Signet, Felwar Stone, and Talisman of Creativity. Urza can already tap artifacts for mana, so the two CMC rocks aren't worth it. Urza also can't run Jeska's Will, but although it could run Mox Amber, it doesn't work well with Urza. It's only useful if Urza's out, at which point a rock with another ability would be better. However, the four partners are relatively cheap, so Will and Amber both fit in there. The Sandsgreen decks do run Jeweled Lotus, since the commanders they have are powerful and cost enough that it's worth running Jeweled Lotus. Any day someone cracks Lotus to cast a Thrasios or Rograk is a day that I'll have an existential crisis. A lot of Urza's choices are affected by his ability to tap artifacts for mana. Copy Artifact is a good card that can also serve as a win con with the Dramatic Scepter combo, but Everflowing Chalice is a little more niche. Although it can be treated as a bad 2CMC rock, if Urza's out, it's a Mox Sapphire. Jeweled Amulet is in the same position, but better. You can pay into it to get Urza out, and then use it as a normal rock. Sapphire Medallion makes it into a lot of mono blue decks, but not needing to tap to provide ramp is a huge bonus here. Malcolm and Kedis run City of Traders, since it can power out Malcolm very quickly in order to start generating treasures. Having to sacrifice it whenever you play a land is definitely a large drawback though, and Malcolm and Kedis is the deck best positioned to deal with it. Although it could definitely benefit the other decks, Thras and Roger can't take advantage of it as much and Urza is a mid-range deck, so City of Traders' drawback will be felt more keenly. Once again, Thras and Roger get a shiny toy that the other decks don't in Carpet of Flowers. It's a staple, and if you can, you should run it. However, it also runs Crystal Vein, which is a less potent City of Traders that's easier to play around. It also invests more heavily into the two CMC mana rocks. It has access to more, but they also work better with this deck's play pattern. Roger costs no mana, so a 2 CMC rock on turn 2 means you can polymorph on turn 3, assuming you hit your land drop. Springleaf Drum also takes advantage of Roger for some cheap ramp. Treasure Vault can be used to provide the extra mana needed to combo off with Interaction Up, or it can filter colorless mana into colored mana. Since most of the rocks that are mana positive only produce colorless mana, this is a definite plus. Finally, Thras and Roger get Wild Growth. It's cheap, resilient ramp. Now that we've looked at the individual card choices, let's take a bird's eye view and look at the general composition of the decks. Malcolm and Kedis run the highest removal, but some of that is due to an emphasis on cards with versatility, since they can definitely afford it. For Urza, an important factor in the amount of removal run is Aether Spellbomb. It being an artifact means it's easy to tutor for, which is what enables Urza to keep the removal count low. Malcolm and Kedis also run the highest amount of stack interaction and draw. It can produce insane amounts of mana that even Urza struggles to keep up with, so it can both fuel the interaction and the draw required to fuel the hand. Interestingly, it runs the least amount of tutors, although they all run a decent amount, since they all have tutors that just win them the game. It's no surprise that Thras and Roger runs the most, since it has the most colors. Urza is the only deck with an emphasis on stacks, which makes sense. The deck just plays the stacks game better than the other decks, which are more proactive. Malcolm and Kedis generate enough mana that they're just a tutor away from a win, while having a 0 CMC commander allows Thras and Roger to push for an early win. Even without dorks, green shines through here with Thras and Roger running the most interaction, as well as the most ramp. The extra ramp is a statement of the power of Urza, as well as Malcolm and Kedis. They can both produce large amounts of mana, so the ramp package for these two is designed to pass the bottleneck and get them out. Neither Thrasios nor Rograk produce mana, but Thrasios is a mana dump, so the high ramp count lines up. And there we go, that covers the Polymorph decks. Credit goes to Eisenhertz, Keegan52, Sinivy, and Urza Serva for the Urza deck, Jackalope Keem for the Malcolm and Kedis deck, 
and Ephon and the Tangelo for the Thrasios and Rograk deck. They were extremely helpful with the finer details of the decks. Once again, the links to the decks will be in the description, and they all have primers, so I would highly recommend checking them out. Additionally, the Urza and Malcolm and Kedis decks have video deck techs available, and those will be linked as well. Credit also goes to Scryfall for the images. If you liked the video or found it helpful, please like and subscribe so you don't miss a video. I'll also be running polls on Twitter to determine what future videos will be, so if you'd like a say, the link is in the description as well. Thank you all for taking the time to watch, I'm your host Michael, and I'll see you at the beginning of your next upkeep for another episode of Recurring Insight.